Cardinal Let me get this straight. You don't believe in God because of Alice in Wonderland? Not through the looking glass. That poem, The Walrus and the Carpenter, that's an indictment of organized religion. The walrus, with his girth and his good nature, he obviously represents either Buddha or, or with his tusks, the Hindu elephant god, Lord Ganesha. That takes care of your Eastern religions. Now, the carpenter, which is an obvious reference to Jesus Christ, who was raised the carpenter's son, he represents the Western religions. Now, in the poem, what do they do? What do they do? They, they dupe all these oysters into following them and then proceed to shock and devour the helpless creatures en masse. Now, I don't know what that says to you, but to me, it says that following these faiths based on mythological figures ensures the destruction of one's inner being. Organized religion destroys who we are by inhibiting our actions, by inhibiting our decisions, out of, out of fear of some, some intangible parent figure who, who shakes a finger at us from thousands of years ago and says, and says, do it, do it and I'll fucking spank you. How about a little Walt Whitman poetry to elucidate what Aeon Bagnostic Radio is all about? What you're all about? Kindly forward it to me by a listener. It goes. Laws for creations, for strong artists and leaders, for fresh broods of teachers and perfect literates for America. For noble savants and coming musicians, all must have reference to the ensemble of the world and the compact truth of the world. There shall be no subjects too pronounced. All work shall illustrate the divine law of indirections. What do you suppose creation is? What do you suppose will satisfy the soul except to walk free and own no superior? What do you suppose I would intimate to you in a hundred ways, but the man or woman is as good as God? and that there is no God any more divine than yourself, and that that is what the oldest and newest myths finally mean, and that you or anyone must approach creation through such laws. If we have souls, they are made of the love we share, undimmed by time, unbound by death. The poem reminds me of how we true seeker warriors and modern day Tom Sawyers are referred to in such Gnostic texts as the Apocalypse of Adam. And that is, the generation without a king over it. That's what we are in essence, and that's why you have arrived to the virtual Alexandria through the God above God that can. For you now know you have no king, or god, or fate over you. Only these three within your untamed heart, and at your sacred and profane service. It was philosopher William James who said that God is all-powerful and all-knowing. Therefore, he can only know what is known, and can only do what is possible. Not us Gnostics, lovers of the Esoterica, and Dionysian freethinkers. We know the unknown, and we do the impossible. And together we are all achieving this at Aeon Byte Gnostic Radio. Hell, I'm gonna grant you the greatest wish. I'm gonna show you a world without sin. And I am with you. Because we are all the same, and all together, goo 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 And we are known as Abraxas, the ultimate Archon in a game of Archon Thrones. Beyond my Hierophany, I am also known as Miguel Connor, your Sabaoth hosts of hosts, and general madman across the waters of creation. Welcome to the machine, my son, and the means to escape it. What is real? How do you define real? If you're talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, what you can taste and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. Beyond this, a new look at the God above God that can. 
if you hadn't noticed already. All shows and media are more easily accessible to your sulfur-stained fingertips as the Aeon Byte 2.0 initiative moves forward. Take a look and let me know what you think. And much thanks to Luthien for his Aeonic work at getting the site built faster than Elsa or Dr. Manhattan could build their crystalline castles. I am tired of Earth. These people, I'm tired of being caught in the tangle of their lives. So please continue supporting Aeon Bite in any way you can. With a few shekels here and there, or becoming a patron for the Patreon campaign. The links for varied hyletic or psychic sucker are at the website including Amazon affiliates, where I get a kickback even if you buy other stuff than the books presented. So don't be shy, as Cat Stevens sang, and let us continue growing this heretical community, building vast futures of light for you, and growing that eternal soundtrack of the counterculture. We're turning a corner, we're just getting started, and Sackless and his slaves in the establishment, his butt boys in New Age, and his whores in Orthodoxy are shivering as their revolution continues for the spirit in the mind. All in the name of Hypatia of Alexandria. More than ever, we're writing our own gospel and living our own myth. You are not your job. You're not how much money you have in the bank. You're not the car you drive. You're not the contents of your wallet. You're not your fucking khakis. You were the all singing, all dancing crap of the world. Certainly one of the great paladins of Sophia for this podcast has been one of my favorite Bible scholars. And that is the mighty Robert Price. Check out his homepage at robertmprice.mindvendor.com that can. And certainly check out our past interviews found on YouTube, iTunes, and our new subscription area at the God Above God that can. Bob incarnates at the Virtual Alexandria on this approximately October 15, the year of our Demiurge 2014. We'll be discussing his new book and Cracker Jack work. Killing History, where Bob takes down Bill O'Reilly's sad little book, Killing Jesus, as well as the orthodoxy behind it and around it and soaking all society to ignorance, the greatest of sins as the Gospel of Philip states. This is a marketing holocaust, 24 hours a day for the rest of our lives the powers that be are hard at work, dumbing us to death. Furthermore, Bob will feed us the dope on two important Gnostic scriptures that deal with the pre-cosmic cataclysm. And those are the reality of the Archons and on the origin of the world. And the reality of the Archons is also known as the nature of the Archons, or sometimes called the hypostasis of the Archons. Take your pick. Neither Bob nor I will go blow to blow on these epics between Sophia and her son Yaldabaoth. So please procure a summary at your nearest Wikipedia or Gnosis.org. However, you will achieve so much revelation and new perspectives on the Gnostic heresy and the genesis of Christianity. So you better stick that red pill suppository and red pill tampon where the angry solar god don't shine because you are about to have your mind expanded and reality disbanded. By the power of truth, I, while living, have conquered the universe. Don't think of the reality of the Archons, or on the origin of the world, or any Gnostic writings as negative or bleak. 
even as the Sethians were the punk rockers of the ancient world. Remember, only in the so-called Gnostic text does Jesus laugh, dance, or have a good time. Crucifixion lasts hours! It's a slow, horrible death! Well, at least it gets you out in the open air. The Gnostics wrote parody and satire, and with that sci-fi sensibility full of cosmic joy. There is always a more than apparent sense that everything is going to be alright, that there is a rescue plan, and all you need to do is ignite your inner infinity. I mean, Gnosis means you've just discovered that you are a divine being older than time and space, that you have a spark that shines brighter than all the stars in the universe put together. So why be in an Eeyore or Morrissey mood even as you rage against heaven and storm the gates of hell for your misplaced childhoods and paradises lost? Everything is going to be all right. Don't you see? It's not about you. It's about them. But I can't go back. Don't know that you got a choice, son. No man can walk out on his own story. Dovetailing into this, I like what Richard Smoley wrote on the effects of Gnosis in his book, Inner Christianity. It goes... The cognitive awakening of Gnosis is usually a gradual process, rather than a single, transformative vision. This liberation of the true I from the world does not make moral behavior irrelevant. It makes it easier. Detachment from externalities makes it easier to love one's fellow humans because one is then free from wanting things and nursing hidden agendas. It's been a brilliant journey of self-awakening. Now you've simply got to ask yourself this. What is happiness to you? Furthermore, on the topic of being negative or bleak in the writings, the Gnostics used or more like weaponized myth, that inner language of the spirit to light a fire under your butt to the nature of suffering. But they walk that intoxicating walk of fiery ecstasy, from the Valentinians to the Cathars, that so many others in the Jenner population wanted to walk as well. That is, until the secular and religious forces broke their kneecaps. We are the generation without a king over it, and that's the true good news, my beloved true seekers. That's the true good news. No matter what anybody tells you, words and ideas can change the world. So to end, before we have so much fun with Bob, let me quote you a little Joseph Campbell as we delve also into the power of myth that saturates the reality of the Archons and on the origin of the world, as well as the saga of Jesus Christ, so you don't get too bogged down in literalism. Oh, and after some music by Workman Song, a true Gnostic artist who we interviewed a few weeks ago. We're having so much fun, I tell ya. But this is what Joseph Campbell said. It would not be too much to say that myth is a secret opening through which the inexhaustible energies of the cosmos pour into human cultural manifestation. Religion, philosophies, arts, the social forms of primitive and historic man, prime discoveries in science and technology, the very dreams that blister, sleep, boil up from the basic magic ring of myth. The generation without a king over it. We're having so much fun. And heresy shouldn't be this much fun. But it just is. It just is. Hello and goodbye as always. If 
God exists. I don't think he sits around sinking people's little boats. I don't think he causes earthquakes and landslides or dreams up ways to make people's brakes fail. If there is a God, surely he's everywhere. He's in everything. He's even in this courtroom. He's in the sea. He's in a lobster. He's in a line of Robert Burns. He's in a woman's thigh, the soft anvil of creation. He's in a face. This is the A.M. Byte interview, and with us we definitely have the pleasure of being joined by Robert Price to discuss a lot of fiction, including his new book, Killing History, and something about the Archons. How are you doing today, Bob? Oh, terrific, as well as can be expected under the oppression of the Archons. <laughs> well, we'll try to break through this veil of illusion. So mm. uh, why don't we start with the Archons and some of the uh, Nag Hammadi library text. Um, mm. First, the Archons. Uh, most people assume that the Archons were sort of drawn out from uh, Paul's writings and these sort of uh, mysterious rulers and princes that he talks about and then sort of developed by the Gnostics. Is that basically it, Bob? Uh, that's uh, an oversimplification. It's like connecting the dots, leaving out a few dots. Uh, I mean, who knows, right? But it, it occurs to me that the stuff you find in the Nag Hammadi texts with uh, a committee of creators and so on, uh, the, uh, the different versions of the Eden story in uh, the Testimony of Truth, the Origin of the World, the Hypothesis of the Archons, and so on, are... Uh, Either they're at least picking up on the polytheism clearly implied in Genesis. Uh, let us make man, uh, and uh, behold, the man has become like one of us, and and so forth. That there were there must have been more than one divine entity involved in the whole Garden of Eden scenario, the creation of Adam and Eve, and so on. Now it could be that they're speculating who could that have been. Uh, yeah, that's fine, but they're. Um, the, the fact remains that this does underlie the text of Genesis, that there were several uh, entities, a and uh, so does the notion that God is lying, or gods or whoever is lying to Adam and Eve about the, the fruit being deadly poison. And why? Well, because he doesn't want the humans to get uh, his or their prerogatives. I mean, I don't think, you know, you got to try to, if you don't like that, in Genesis, you have to do quite a bit of footwork to get out of that, and, and none of it's convincing. So I think they're seeing what is there. They may be giving their own names to it, but even there, I wouldn't think so, because, of course, archon is a generic term, the princes, the rulers, and so forth. Uh, well, um, that's, uh, who else would they be? I mean, this this whole thing is like there's their spin on it, but it's part of this remote Old Testament idea that um, there are many gods who rule the, the various nations of the world, and uh, in fact the nations were numbered so that each one of these gods or sons of Elohim would, would have a, a, a nation to rule. So there are rulers, I mean it's not just angels in the Old Testament, they're rulers of nations, uh, the, Daniel mentions this kind of thing. Uh, the, was, uh, Gabriel appears late to Daniel and said, I'm sorry I couldn't get here sooner, but I had to battle the prince of Persia, well, the archon of Persia, the, the ruling spirit. And uh, so it seems to me, that, and of course, the, uh, the, the fall of the sons of God, who the heck ever they were, right? Well, they, they had to be these, these uh, lesser gods, and they mated with mortal women. And you see all of this stuff uh, elaborated in Jewish apo uh, apocryphal, pseudepigraphical works. It was common belief, and that was easy to harmonize with Hellenistic ideas of the stoichia, the intermediate elemental spirits that the Stoics believed in. And so uh, there isn't all that much in the fundamental conception of the archons and uh, their rule and all that that wasn't kind of common property in, in the ancient world. The Pauline language seems to reflect it, 
but if, if one were to say that rather than give rise to it, because if you said, ah, oh, the Gnostics just got it from Ephesians or something, which they do quote, but if that's where they got it from, then you got to ask, well, what did, what did Ephesians mean by it? Uh, clearly, I mean, even if you never heard of any Gnostic texts, it's very clear you're talking about principalities and powers, rulers of this age or this world, and who dominate the, the sons of wrath and all. I mean, mostly it's, it's spelled out there anyway. You've got the Gnostic Pleroma in, uh, in Colossians. You've got the three categories of human beings in 1 Corinthians. And it seems to me uh, the, uh, the Pauline material is just uh, commenting on a pre-existing tradition which the Gnostics have inherited too, whether before or after the Pauline epistles. And Bob, do you see, or is there a name for this type of literature you find in On the Origins of the World and the Hypostasis or the Archons, where they just uh, reinterpret Genesis? Well, uh, some of it is found in Jewish and somewhat Christianized Jewish pseudepigrapha, books of Enoch and Jubilees and so forth. And they they often do not have uh, the notion of a spiritual illumination that you find in the Gnostic texts, but it's in a sense it's all apocalyptic in that it's revelation literature. Some of the Nag Hammadi texts just take for granted. Well, yeah, here here's the truth. Well, where could they have gotten it? Uh, probably from some sort of revelation. Also, it it uh, you you've already got it the the fundamentals of it in the Garden of Eden story. So and and as for the knowledge, well, you really even have that too, because the Jewish pseudepigraphical stories have the sons of God giving knowledge to the the fledgling humans. They kind of spin the thing in a negative way, so that they give knowledge of uh, uh, death dealing weapons for men and uh, the arts of cosmetic and seduction to women. But uh, as Margaret Barker argues, this was probably a bigger deal in ancient Israel than we would guess from something like the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, which are more likely preserving uh, and in a more unedited form what is taken for granted by the canonical writers. Uh, so uh, even all of that is to say that uh, it's really part of the warp and woof of um, of uh, Jewish literature and comes from the same source, I, I think. It, it isn't really a separate, special bunch of books that somehow leaked into the tradition. So basically, as I've heard, especially fundamentalists like to say, well, these texts were anti-Jewish and anti-Semitic. What is your answer to that? Well, it is possible to read it that way, but uh, I think that uh, it's more of a Jewish reaction to what some mystical Jews began to consider oversimplification and a kind of dumbed down editing and and domestication of the stuff. Uh, it's those who uh, are rejecting and reviling the archons who lied to Adam and Eve. Uh, again, they're getting it from the Bible in the first instance, and it seems to me that it's You'd have to ask, who are they portraying with uh, the image of gods who want to stymie human knowledge and progress? Well, that's what the old rationalists used to call priestcraft, and it's, I think they're talking about, uh, it's like traditional Catholics despising Vatican II or uh, Louis Farrakhan despising uh, the, the reforms made by Warith Dean Muhammad after the death of Elijah Muhammad. It's, uh, it's a partisanship for a repressed and condemned belief that was once very common, and, uh, and these people are not given up on it. So it isn't anti-Jewish so much as it's uh, against people who have emasculated what the writers consider the true biblical religion. These guys aren't Marcionites. Like at the end of, uh, on the origin of the world, it says that the writings of the prophets, and they seem to mean the Jewish prophets, are key to uh, the coming apocalypse. And why would you even get into, why would you reinterpret all of these Jewish sources if you were simply a Marcionite, right? And if you simply rejected uh, the Old Testament, and if you were anti-Jewish, 
why would you be rejecting the Old Testament? So it seems to me that's just a convenient oversimplification. Exactly. And uh, to, going back to the nature of the Archons, the Archons are these sort of godly beings, uh, these cosmic bureaucrats, but they're also this amazing bullying rapists. Uh, mm. where, what is their template? Do you think they just, uh, these writers saw what the Romans were doing to other cultures and just made them into celestial beings? Uh, well, I don't know. It's possible that uh, since the thing with uh, the Archons lusting after the spiritual Eve and her uh, getting away from her by turning into a tree, apparently the tree of knowledge, and uh, the uh, the uh, Archons raping a, uh, a cloudy uh, mirage Eve. It could be, like a lot of this more, more clearly parallels elements of Greek myth, where Hera was rescued but got assaulted in a her her uh, her cloudy form I think it says uh, a simulacrum was uh, was molested by whoever it was I've forgotten now uh, so that seems directly reflected but also Daphne who has to run from the lustful uh, uh, urges of Apollo and uh, outwits him by somehow becoming a tree. And uh, if that is so close, you've got to figure, yeah, this is syncretism, though even that may be too, uh, too artificial a way of viewing it. It may just be shared mythemes. Uh, like the, I mean, Genesis abounds in stories parallel to uh, ancient uh, Greek myth, so maybe their heritage too. But I have a hunch that the ultimate, well, also, let me just say, the idea of the, the archons as rapists is uh, just a slight variant of an old Jewish idea that even the Orthodox rabbis propounded that uh, where did Cain get his uh, his evil nature? Why was he a murderer? Well, he must. I mean, he's, he's so close to the creation of God. Uh, where did this bad element come from? As the church lady would say, could it be Satan? <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, it was. He must have had uh, the sa satanic DNA. And uh, First John comes pretty darn close to saying that. And so I think that... Um, it's, again, an inherited notion. It's trying to explain the origin of evil in humanity, especially since later on, in, on the origin of the world, they talk about how humanity is divided into these different groups, these different strata, and what makes the difference between them. Well, they all have these souls that have, have been projected into them uh, by the, the good guys, uh, Pista Sophia and so on. But uh, they were, th these people were, these early humans were molested by the Archons too, though with varying degrees of success, so that um, the, uh, the, the real slobs, the immoral, the, uh, the evil, they are predominated by uh, the, the sperm, the seed, the DNA, as we would say, of the archons, but uh, many of the others uh, were immune to their influence, and that explains the mix, they say, in the church, though I, I think they mean the whole human race. Um, and they're trying to explain why in uh, the congregation you have people like them, the Sethian Gnostics, who know what, they're, what the deal is, and uh, other people that don't and would persecute them if they knew who they were. But uh, it's, it's theodicy. How did we get this intermixing of uh, evil uh, in a world that, um, or in, among souls who were planted by Pista Sophia and so on? It's not completely consistent, or at least I can't follow it com consistently in every place, but I suspect it's just what the whole Gnostic thing is, uh, ultimately a theodicy. If there's, a, if there's a good God way up there, how did the world get get as it is, how did people get as they are, it must be the uh, DNA from the Archons or Satan or whoever else. I tend not to, to look for politics under every bush, a kind of a theological McCarthyism. Uh, like I know a lot, it's really a big fad today to say that Paul had prophetic uh, knowledge of post-colonial leftism, and so he uh, he was uh, when he, he's talking about Rome, he really means the United States and and George Bush. And all that. I think that's just a <laughs> typical liberal uh, manipulation of the text to make it a ventriloquist dummy. 
And speaking of archons, both the origin of the world and hypostasis have the story of the enthronement of Sabaoth, the redeemed mm. archon who gets put into heaven. Is this a story that was going around, or what do you know of uh, Sabaoth? This is really one of the most striking things in it. Why would they redeem this one, uh, the son of Ialdabaoth, the demiurge? And they kind of split him into two characters, it seems to me. In fact, they used to say Ialdabaoth is a slight garbling of Yahweh Sabaoth, Lord of Hosts, or whatever. And they even bring up that derivation only with uh, Sabaoth, that uh, he is known as the Lord of Powers or Lord of Hosts or whatever. That is interesting to me, as if they're trying to say, you know, the creation isn't all that bad. It isn't simply, they talk about Yaldabaoth as the ultimate creator. But, uh, the, uh, but the world we know, and the heavens and all that stuff, were made by Sabaoth after he was reformed. Are they kind of mitigating the pessimism of the original idea? It seems sort of like it is, especially when it says, all this happened according to the will of Pistis Sophia and, and uh, the ultimate father father and all that. It, I don't know, but uh, to me, that looks like this kind of typical reassimilation degree by degree to the social order against which the radical movement first repudiated and, and differentiated themselves. Uh, I think like Marcionism seems to be a kind of uh, going back some steps toward the world that uh, that Gnosticism had simply rejected. And I wonder if that's what's happening here. Uh, but I don't know. There are probably better interpretations of it. But. Yeah, what's also striking in the hypostasis of the Archons is you don't have a Jesus figure. In fact, you don't even have a Seth figure. Somehow the, uh, the Gnostic revealers is Elilith and uh, hmm. Norea. Why do, you, why do you think this is, Bob? I don't know. My guess is that, like, and where'd they get the idea that Norea incinerated the Ark? Uh, that's got to mean something. And, and apparently there were loads of Norea texts that we don't even have that are mentioned in the, these texts. Uh, and uh, that always sets off my uh, suspicions that we have a, a kind of compilation and harmonization of very different original versions of Gnosticism, like why are there different uh, Sophia analogs as well, some of them in the same text? Uh, why do they di bother differentiating uh, Zoe or Zoe from uh, from uh, Sophia and all that? Uh, what's the difference between her and the, the uh, spiritual Eve? And I uh, sort of suspect uh, maybe each of these was the analogous figure in a different uh, a, a form of the religion, just like all the uh, the goddesses in the Olympian pantheon are really pretty much versions of each other. There's not that much difference. Or the three goddesses of Mecca. Uh, they're really pretty much the same character and do the same thing. And so you wonder if uh, people have groups, clans, sects, uh, religions met one another as their membership perhaps was shrinking and like modern congregations do saying you know these people believe pretty much what we do though they're they they use different names what the heck let's put them all together and uh, maybe this one's the uh the the daughter of that one that was albrecht alt's view of where you got the gods of the fathers in genesis uh, that uh, the God of Abraham, uh, the uh, fear of Isaac, and the, the mighty one of Jacob were uh, tribal totems, sort of, uh, for different groups, which eventually joined together and established a hierarchy. The oldest or biggest of the groups was the ones who were the Abraham uh, people, moon god worshippers, since that's what Abraham seems to be, and uh, Isaac sun god worshippers, and um, Jacob, another moon god, they all got together and figured, okay, there's a genealogy. This is the ranking of the, the clans and their authorities. And so the gods were separate, but then they said, oh, what the heck, they're all the same. Forget the sun and moon thing. I suspect you can see that sort of... Uh, that sort of uh, evolution by accumulation 
in um, in the Nag Hammadi text, which otherwise seems needlessly redundant. I mean, just pointlessly, sort of like listening to me. I guess it's uh, uh, it, it, you don't need this much of it. So why did they they uh, stuff it with all these equivalent demiurges and and so forth? I don't know, but I'm guessing that they're just trying to get everybody's favorite in. Yeah, and it seems uh, the hypostasis of the Archons is an earlier text, but on the origins of the world, it's a later text, and it's a big soup. I mean, they're throwing mm. in eros and all these other mm -hmm. texts and everything, and at the end of uh, Origin of the World, it seems to be a universalist uh, message, while the hypostasis of the Archons is just basically the, the root of Norea. Do you think later on they wanted to make sure everybody got saved in Alexandria? Uh, could well be, because you have the same sort of thing in, jeez, uh, which one is it? There's one of the apocryphal apocalypses of the apostles, how's that for uh, alliteration, uh, <laughs> where uh, in one version it says ah, everybody's going to heaven finally. Uh, I like what uh, Crossan says in an interview about that. It's like, don't tell everybody, or they'll, you know, they'll start taking liberties. <laughs> but uh, well, or uh, like in Mahayana Buddhism, uh, nobody's getting saved till everybody's getting saved. It, it seems like uh, you, the more, um, like the evangelistic mandate. Gee, I sure wish everybody would be saved. Let's try to save them all merges into the idea of universal salvation, whether you reach them or not. Okay, you know, it's not the will of God that any should perish. So I wouldn't be surprised, though, of course, you do see the opposite in things like the book of Thomas the Contender or Q. Both of them seem to have discernible, detachable, later strata where there is this bitter, resentful um, cursing of those who have not listened to the message. And uh, so it can go both ways, you bastards. You didn't accept what we said. Well, you asked for it to hell with you. But, you know, different people have different religious sympathies, and it can go uh, either way. What about this idea of Jesus being sort of absent, or as you once told me, just sort of tacked on, like in the Apocrypha of John? I mean, uh, why, why was this done if these groups thought, thought of themselves as Christian? It's possible they felt they... Uh, had to uh, take refuge in uh, that uh, group that they had to go underground. I mean, we know in uh, some types of Islam and various others, especially in times of persecution, you had to feign conversion. Uh, Muslims uh, and Jews uh, feigning conversion to Catholicism to avoid persecution. It's possible that's what they did, and they figured, well, our the stuff we really believe uh, as Sethians could get into the wrong hands here. Let's make sure that we have a, a, a vestigial reference to Jesus. So they'll say, well, you're kind of weird, but all right, it's Christian. I don't know, because as you say, you do have to explain why is it tacked on. It's it's not like there's a... Re like a, in the Apocalypse of Adam, which uh, seems obviously to be a Zoroastrian um, text, that it, it uh, describes the the illuminator and uh, how it's it's really Zoroaster coming in different uh, versions of it, uh, uh, different iterations over the ages as different uh, Persian heroes and prophets and all that. Suddenly, at the end of it, Jesus is one of them. Well, now that seems to me, uh, you know, uh, this is obviously subjective, but that to me reads like somebody that uh, converted, really converted to Christianity, but uh, figured uh, the whole Zoroastrian thing was like another Old Testament leading up to it. So Jesus really has a place in this. Uh, or even Melchizedek, uh, the the uh, Nagamati text, that kind of looks like these are Sethians who uh, just found they could graft their faith on to Christianity, and uh, what the heck, why not? And really did believe it. Jesus is a, a second coming of Melchizedek, sure. Whereas in, in these, you get the impression that, it, I mean, in the ones I just mentioned, they're not tacked on. It's just another layer added to the, the faith represented there. But in some of them, it's, it seems just tacked on. But you could say the same thing about the epistle of James in the canon. Uh, Jesus is 
is hardly there either. Uh, so who knows? My favorite weird non-Jesus thing in the Nagamati text is the uh, Apocalypse of Paul, where there is no mention at all of Jesus, and Paul is the Gnostic Redeemer. I mean, holy mackerel, you know, what is going on? I, I think the, the Nag Hammadi texts are, are like a fossil record of an incredibly diverse early Christianity. Uh, I think that is underestimated in, in some of the discussions of these texts. They're even not taken seriously by those who are sympathetically interested in them and seem to regard them as some sort of ancient science fiction novels. Maybe it's like Dune or something. Uh, whereas, no, I think uh, Pagels is right. These were the scriptures of living religions. People believed and studied this and had a spirituality based on it. And and that implies, uh, I mean, what's the Zitzim Laban, as we say, the setting in life uh, from which it emerged? There had to have been living religions or living real Christianities, like Bart Ehrman says, lost Christianities. And uh, we still, I think, are under the shadow of the Eusebian paradigm. Well, of course, the Catholic Orthodox Church is the real thing. These guys are just like flying saucer cults today. There's just a few weirdos out there. And the sheer number of them implies that can't be the case. And the sharing of mythemes and so on among different groups, uh, that implies you got whole families, whole species of early Christianities that died out or got stamped out. And so this is the same uh, reason that you have such different interpretations of the serpent. It seems uh, in the mm -hmm. Apocryphon of John, the serpent is Yaldabaoth, but in Hypostasis of the Archons and Origin of the World, uh, the serpent is Sophia. And if, didn't the Manichaeans believe the serpent was actually Jesus? I don't remember. I do remember, though, Philo says that, uh, and he doesn't elaborate on it, I believe, he says that, yeah, the name of the serpent was Eve. What? I mean, and this, you know, there's no, no possibility of Christian Gnostic influence as a Hellenistic, philosophically oriented Jew. He comes up already with, uh, with the, ba the basic idea. Uh, and uh, <laughs> so, yeah, there were, th this is yet, I mean, I, he wasn't a Christian, but this just uh, fortifies my thinking on this, that, uh, yeah, this wasn't just some wacky brand X version of, of Christianity somebody cooked up in their basement. Uh, you know, this is, uh, these are much more widely known important beliefs and whole families of beliefs. And doesn't this have to do with the the name in Hebrew and Aramaic of uh, Eve and the serpent? That's where this confusion or these interpretations came about. Uh, well, Eve. Well, I'm more used to thinking of Eve as uh, the same as the goddess Heba, uh, and uh, uh, from the the Greeks, and also. Uh, Aruru, from uh, the way back in the Gilgamesh epic, who was the mother of all living. But uh, I, I'm not versed enough in the linguistics to know if the link between Eve and the serpent is like an opportunistic pun, like most of the etymological notes in the Old Testament, or if they actually do derive from the same thing. Uh, so I, I don't really know. It's uh, I, I don't know those languages, and so tough to say. And don't some rabbis interpret it as Eve actually having sex with the serpent? Oh yeah, and that's where we got Cain, and uh, and it explicitly says this, but it chalks up all of the children of Adam and Eve to this in uh, the Origin of the World. And, uh, yeah, that's, uh, and of course, and nor is that a new idea, right? Because rabbis have already said it about Cain, uh, and the sons of God, daughters of men. You know, what do you want? There, there it is already. It's, it's a very old idea. Yeah, so they were basically just rebooting old texts like everyone else. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, they might have had their own spin on it. Uh, they might have, like all of these weird uh, names uh, in, in the Nag Hammadi texts and the fact that they call them the incorruptibility and things like that, it's possible that implies they're allegorizing it somewhat, though they don't uh, 
go on to explain uh, why in any great depth. Though, on the other hand, the whole thing is kind of like a huge puzzle, like apocalypses, which ultimately come from the same source, uh, where, yeah, we're not making this easy because we're not aiming it at idiots. In fact, if you're an idiot, good luck understanding this, just like the book of Revelation says. Yeah, I think it was Elaine Pagels that said uh, orthodoxy is grade school. The Gnostic text would be grad school. This is for yeah. learned people who had a background and who were the, the initiated, right? Yeah, yeah, and uh, that that is certainly what they thought. Uh, the, you're, you've got the kid version of it, and I think there's something to that historically. I mean, that's why they stayed in, uh, like the Valentinians were members of uh, Catholic congregations, which Irenaeus bemoans because they didn't. Uh, why would they even bother staying there if they uh, didn't view themselves as part of the same faith? They just wanted to keep an eye out for people that were ready to graduate too. And then they say, you know, there there is uh, more to this, just like Jesus with the rich young ruler. He said, uh, well, you know, stage one, right? The commandments. Oh yeah, yeah, I've kept those all my life. Says, okay, well, if you would be perfect or mature. Sure. I think that's like the Gnostic uh, stance, and um, it, so. And I think it's uh, there really is something to it because I think like Harnack, he really set me onto this when long ago he said that the lasting legacy of Gnosticism, which has otherwise died out, is the pre-existence Christology, that the Jesus who appeared on earth was a manifestation of a pre-existent heavenly being. He says that must come from Gnosticism, that which is its natural home and context. And I've, I think, yeah, that is correct. And uh, not not only that, but that the uh, once you start Looking with those through those lenses, you can see that the whole soteriology thing for the uh, Plan B for the the Sukikoi, uh, yeah, the pew potatoes, as I like to call them, uh, th that was uh, that comes from the mystery religions. Uh, that uh, the idea of uh, joining the, uh, the the savior in his saving deed by initiation rites. That just has to be part and parcel of the mystery religions. And the Gospels, with all the miracles and all that, as Kester and Robinson said long ago, yeah, these are typical aritologies. They're, they're uh, hero tales of the, the gods and the demigods and so on. And that so Christianity as we know it, I think, is a, is a secondary or tertiary fusion of uh, these three items, and that uh, their very existence implies there were older, more sophisticated uh, views, especially with the Gnostic thing, and that we do have it dumbed down, that the Gnostic thing was probably uh, the, the earlier, and the, what we have is the Sunday school version, which I don't mean to I don't mean to disparage it, because of course the classic Western Christian story is, is a great epic, and, and uh, much is to be learned from it, but I think, yeah, and so it's a good thing. I mean, I, I have to admit, reading some of these uh, texts is almost like reading an auto repair manual. It's, uh, it's <laughs> yeah. just, there's, once I was talking to a, a professor up at uh, Unification Seminary, and he said that he didn't know why they had such trouble getting people interested in the divine principle of uh, their scripture, which is a pretty dry textbook. And I said to him, well, I, I think it is dry and technical, and he, what you need to do is to uh, write up your own gospel, because Reverend Moon did uh, some really fascinating midrashic interpretation of the Old and the New Testament. He would tell his uh, members, here's what really happened with Judas, or Jesus and John the Baptist, and who was really the mother of uh, Jesus. It was Zechariah the priest, and here's how. I mean, fascinating. Fictional, obviously, but uh, fascinating. So I said to my friend, why don't you let me write a gospel as, as Reverend Moon says it happened, and make a biblical-like narrative? And so uh, I did, and they published it in their, uh, in their journal. I don't think anything ever really came from it, but uh, that's, I think that is a real problem. The gospels are much more readable than this stuff, as fascinating as it is. 
All right, Bob, well, why don't we continue, move on to the other fiction. Let's talk about your book, uh, Killing History, which is your critique of uh, Bill O'Reilly and Martin Dugard's work, Killing uh, Jesus. Why did you decide to tackle this project? Well, once I uh, read, I think I was asked to review it for um, uh, American Rationalist. So I uh, read it and thought, oh my gosh, what is this? <laughs> and uh, I mean, I wasn't too surprised in a way, but uh, every once in a while I think, holy, what are they doing? They, O'Reilly, I watch the O'Reilly factor quite a bit, and I like Bill O'Reilly. I know the people hear that who are kind of in our sphere of uh, interest, and suddenly I'm the heretic because anything goes religiously, but you better be a P, capital P progressive or you're a heretic <laughs> headed for hell, uh, which I am. And uh, so they say, I don't care what you said about O'Reilly's book on Jesus. How can you stomach O'Reilly? Oh, brother. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, the, uh, the the book is, uh, O'Reilly's on the air all the time saying uh, that this is a book of history, not uh, not faith and religion. And he says, in fact, we don't call Jesus the Messiah. We call him the Nazarene, as if that's uh, neutral and objective. Yeah, that'll do it, yeah. <laughs> and it, it's all the time they're saying Jesus is publicly teaching that he's the Son of God. What? And they give you uh, passages, but they're, they say no such thing, or they're obviously redactional creations and, and so on. But the authors know nothing about that. They tell you who, who they've studied in an appendix to it, and what a surprise. It's virtually all conservative apologists. Uh, they, they don't really seem to know the subject, and it's filled with uh, uh, misstatements of... Uh, uh, on scholarship, well, archaeology has pretty much brought every back to a, everybody back to a more conservative view of the Gospels. Like hell, it's just the opposite, uh, and you can tell again who they're reading and whose propaganda they're swallowing. Um, but the what really gets me is how they just uh, not not real often, but I can think of two instances especially. They make up stuff that isn't even hinted at in the Gospels and say, "Well, yeah, this happened to Jesus." Like, um, they uh, have uh, Jesus and Joseph hefting their hard hats and lunch buckets and going down the road to Sephoris, <laughs> which is being constructed. Well, if Jesus was a carpenter, and I think Geza Vermesh is right, that's a misunderstanding of a metaphor in Mark. It means uh, a, an exponent of Scripture, uh, like a woodworker in the text. Uh, given the context, but assuming, yeah, he was a carpenter, uh, then it's conceivable that uh, he and his dad went to this great construction job. But there, Sephoris isn't even mentioned in the, the Gospels, and there's there's no hint of this. He just says, oh, that might have happened, so it did. Or there's this thing that... Uh, Josephus tells us this incident under Archelaus in Jerusalem, a kind of a almost a dress rehearsal for 70 A.D., this atrocity where uh, Archelaus has Roman soldiers butcher a whole bunch of Jewish pilgrims in the city. I think this is reflected in Luke Garble that uh, they told him about those Galileans whose blood Pilate mixed with their sacrifices. I think he's mixed up who, who it was. But... but um, O'Reilly and Dugard say Jesus, Mary, and Joseph were at Jerusalem at the time and saw this and narrowly escaped with their lives. Where do you get this? I don't think it's even in an apocryphal gospel. It's just, well, they could have seen it. They might have been in Jerusalem. What? This is just not historical writing. And the fact that what they do include that is in the, the Gospels, it's just, uh, it's like the old mock of the New York Times, everything that fits we print. Uh, and uh, that's kind of what, what happens. They, they, uh, they have an uncritical view uh, and, uh, of the Gospels and figure, they, it's like what Colling would call the old scissors and paste historian. We have precious little of it, so let's use all the the uh, data we have, and uh, if we find there's a contradiction, let's flip a coin. And uh, that's kind of what they're doing. They're just compiling it, and um, there's there's no attempt to 
weigh out what's true or not. They'll just take what elements they like of the different baptism stories and stitch them together, giving no hint that the stories are very different. Same thing with the nativity stories, which are just, you cannot harmonize them, uh, like Raymond Brown admits that. But uh, these guys just pick and choose, and uh, they don't really deal with the implication. There are some things they cut. I mean, this is my favorite example of their supposedly critical view. They say, now, you know, uh, Jesus couldn't have been heard if he was on the cross when he said, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. So what's, what do you conclude from that? Well, it's made up later. No, Jesus must have said it a few minutes before when he was there waiting to be crucified uh, on Golgotha. Uh, and uh, so that, that's the only inaccuracy. It was a few minutes off. Like, we've got to put it in somewhere. Uh, it's just incredible, uh, like redoing, a, like if, as if you had a slightly defective jigsaw puzzle and found you had to get out the scissors and, and shave one of the pieces a bit to get it in there. And it's just like a hopeless muddle of, of and the whole thing is really a, like a historical novel, the way it's presented. Uh, it's, uh, it's just and the, the stuff that is added, the stuff that's subtracted, like no Last Supper. I mean, the Last Supper is just emasculated. They cut out all that Johannine stuff, I think because they um, have the Eucharist uh, in John uh, 6 instead. Uh, but they don't tell you why it's gone. And, and it's reduced to like a scene out of a if they ever make one, a, D, a Disney Jesus movie. movie. The, the disciples are like the seven dwarves. And it's, uh, I could go on and on and on. The, the apocalyptic discourse on the Mount of Olives, that is so denatured. Jesus just sort of looks to the future. And, wait a minute, what about the wars and rumors of wars? Well, of course, they cut this out because Jesus says in it that the end of the world will come uh, in the current generation. So they can't do that, right? It's all hero worship uh, for Jesus, so uh, forget that. And the whole thing is just grossly irresponsible and anything but a work of scholarship. But, Bob, uh, they, don't they take out the miracles? Doesn't that make it history if there's no miracles? Well, this is really cagey because they say, since this is a historical work, we can't just put miracles in there. Not that they didn't happen, but it's a matter of faith. And yet, uh, when they, uh, they're cagey about it, they say... Uh, rumors are coming back to Pilate or whoever that uh, Jesus walked on water and, and uh, changed water into wine. And then they'll, they'll even say, eyewitnesses said this. So they're, they're, they all but say the miracles happen. Because if you point to that, those passages and say, well, wait a minute, you've got miracles in here. Oh, no, no, we just say the people said there were miracles. Why don't you say that people said there was a Jesus at all, but that's all we know. Uh, so they're really cagey, and they have, uh, they just say without even that qualifier that um, Jesus fulfilled all these prophecies, which they summarize, uh, and of course they're all taken out of context and, and so on. They don't know that. The O'Reilly and Dugard have never looked into it. This is just what apologists tell them. So they say, Jesus fulfilled these prophecies. This is a historical uh, treatment? It's, it's just uncritical hogwash. What's funny is, don't, don't they leave in the cursing of the fig tree? That seems like a miracle. Yeah, that, I believe that is the one where they just plain say it happened. Like, in, in here you're seeing, you're getting a quick glimpse of uh, like an off uh, where where you think you're off the mic but it's uh, it's going anyway like they slip their their real beliefs slip out here and uh, it's it's really just cagey apologetics in a fictional form almost like Frank Morrison's who moved the stone it's really irritating i mean i like o'reilly politically which i know is blasphemy and heresy but uh, I, that does not make me inclined to 
do the butt covering in this case. I mean, it's like Sean Penn telling you about politics. <laughs> he has, he might be a good actor. I don't know. I can't stand to look at the guy, so I couldn't tell one way or the other. Uh, but uh, he certainly, or let's, let's get our views on the environment from Sting. Or uh, get out of here. She, Susan Sarandon, she's the one that knows economics. <laughs> Come on, get real. And this is just... Uh, the, the same kind of nonsense. In fact, to show uh, the absurdity of it, though it's evident on every page, both his and mine, uh, I have the what I call the missing chapter, where I say, well, uh, Riley didn't cover the resurrection. Of course, he does have the empty tomb thing, and nobody's ever found the body since, so it's like, you know, poking in the ribs. Uh, well, what could have happened? Uh, obviously, it must have rose from the dead. They, they just leave that as the obvious inference. Well, I said, let's, uh, let's add the, uh, the resurrection chapter as O'Reilly would have written it based on the rest of the book. And uh, I show him trying to harmonize all the different uh, first appearances of the risen Jesus and uh, Jesus' sort of stream of consciousness uh, thoughts and uh, his uh, ascension into heaven as if it really happened, and his reunion with his heavenly father as if it really happened, because this is what O'Reilly would have to say if he came clean and put his cards on the table. Yeah, that was a very funny chapter, and your book certainly has a lot of insights beyond just uh, uh, O'Reilly's work. For example, as you say in the Bible, there, in the crucifixion scene, there's actually no mention of Jesus ever being nailed to the cross, right? That came right. afterwards. Yeah, you only get that in a secondary story. I mean, it may have been in the first published version of John, who knows, but it's obvious it's like a secondary story contradicting the one right before it, uh, the Doubting Thomas thing. Uh, he, it's, it's clear in the immediately preceding story that all 12 or well, 11 minus Judas uh, disciples are gathered there, and Jesus breathes on them and empowers them to absolve sins and all that stuff. So clearly... The story implied everybody but Judas was there. But Jesus leaves, and then we have in the next verse that uh, Thomas wasn't there. He was out picking up the pizza, and Jesus somehow didn't notice this when he decided to visit him. And uh, and so then he says, uh, what? You say, Jesus, sorry, I'm not going to believe this until I see him and put my fingers into the nail holes and so on. N nail holes? Well, was Jesus nailed to the cross then? Well, people certainly were, but they were also just tied to the cross. And so it remains, for whatever you want to make of it, that uh, the gospel crucifixion accounts do not say he was nailed to the cross. Nor does any gospel uh, passion narrative have Jesus uh, carrying the cross for a bit and then breaking down under the weight of it and uh, then commandeering Simon of Cyrene to carry it. No, that's just a harmonization because John has him carry it to the site and uh, the others have him unable to carry it and they, uh, they press Simon into service. But fundamentalists like to harmonize the two and so, so does O'Reilly. And uh, there's just a lot of things like that that are old harmonizations that uh, they they prefer to what the Gospels actually say. Yeah, and they, as you say, they take a lot of liberties. For example, don't they describe Jesus as this tall, handsome, muscular guy with long hair? Where did that come from? And probably uh, uh, Jeffrey Hunter's version of King of Kings. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, again, I mentioned in the book, that reminds me of once decades ago I was teaching an intro to New Testament class and uh, I mentioned this theory uh, that some early Christians had that Thomas, the twin, was the twin brother of Jesus. And this woman raised her hand and showed her open Bible, which had one of those old paintings as illustrations. And she said, I bet that's because they looked so much alike, like this picture. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, and uh, and this woman wasn't necessarily stupid. It's just that this is the way she was raised. What did she know? And uh, but but in a book that claims to be a historical scholarly treatment of the Gospels, there's no place for this nonsense. And they color the they fill in the uh, the the texture of sketchy stories in the Gospels 
to make it work as a novel, which this is. And so they, they have Jesus rising from the waters of the Jordan, and uh, as he uh, stands up and walks through the crowd, they all bow in respect. That, that's not in any gospel. What, what are you talking about? They make the descending dove into a uh, an actual dove that rests <laughs> on Jesus' shoulder. Well, boy, I'd, I'd love to know what Mark thought, who has the, the Spirit descend like a dove and enter into him. What did, did Jesus eat it? Uh, what, what else? <laughs> like Ozzy Osbourne, he just bit yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> right. I wish I'd have thought to say that. Yeah, uh, it's it's just so ridiculous, and they just cut and paste stuff they happen to like, whether it fits together or not. Ugh. Since you watch O'Reilly, has he had to defend himself, or how's he done with the criticism? I mean, I know even Bart Ehrman has written about how bad this book is. What have you heard since the book came out? I. Th- uh, the only time I remember seeing anybody on there, I think it was Candida Moss who wrote an interesting book about martyrdom stories in the Old Testament. She had written some kind of review online, and so he invited her on. But her um, her criticisms were very mild, and she was, again, using it as just a liberal propaganda stump to say, well, you're right saying that Jesus was a man of the people and wanted uh, uh, the, the good to be done to the poor and all that. So I think she was just didn't really want to engage him, but just made the, uh, the thing into more of a social gospel preachment. I was surprised how easy she was on him. And I don't remember any of the only other criticisms are little snippets from viewer mail where somebody will object that he left this or that out. And he'll then say, oh, well, it was uh, you know, it's a scholarly study. Anything we couldn't corroborate, we didn't put in. What? I'm going to be a blank book like one of these uh, write-it-yourself journals if, if he had done that. But that's all I've really heard. And if people that say your your book is not enough like the Gospels, so I'm kind of waiting to to hear if um, his producers will contact me to be on, as some people have suggested. But I don't think that they're gonna because uh, I don't think he wants to. I don't mean to say he's afraid of me, but I don't think he cares to, uh, if he even knows about the book, I wouldn't bet on that, but I don't think he'd care to get into a fist-throwing dispute about the whole book and its approach, but I don't watch every night. It's possible he did have some real critic on there. Yeah, and during the book, you can see you, I mean, you definitely don't hold back. You use the word sheer fiction and other things. Yeah. I can just hear you, see you rolling your eyes as you're reading this book. <laughs> what, is there a, any one scene that really jumped out at you that you said, oh, my God, how could they get away with this? Well, I'd say the prophecy thing, just saying straight out Jesus fulfilled these prophecies. And second to that, the idea that Jesus was teaching that he was the incarnation of God. Uh, it's just indefensible as a, as a reading of, of the historical evidence. Uh, it's just amazing to me. Like you said, there was in the, in your book, and you've said before, there was nothing against Jewish law to claim you were the Messiah or a son of God was. I mean, there was nothing blasphemous about that. Yeah, not as far as we know, because I think of Simon Bar Kokhba about a century after that. He actually tossed the Romans out and secured about a year of independence. And um, Rabbi Akiva said, yeah, he is the Messiah. And uh, it eventually turned out, as they say in Superstar, he backed the wrong horse. But uh, he was never vilified as some false prophet or antichrist because he was obviously a hero of Israel. And Akiba wasn't uh, written off as some heretic uh, because of of this. Uh, It's just you could be wrong. You weren't the Messiah, but uh, it wouldn't be blasphemy. And I, I think they're mixing up. They only say that because this is grossly anachronistic and is picturing like the Yavna rabbis as the Sanhedrin uh, reacting to the later Christian claim that uh, Jesus was a god and so forth, so it uh, doesn't that doesn't make sense at all. Uh, speaking of 
the rabbis, one thing I could not believe was that they, they were trying to paint the Pharisees and scribes as legalistic bad guys, and, uh, and they said that they had complicated things because whereas Moses gave ten commandments, these guys now have uh, hundreds of them. Uh, you mean to say you don't know that Moses is uh, credited with 613 commandments in the Torah? Like, it's just elementary ignorance. They refer to Pliny as a historian. Obviously, they haven't looked into it. They're just misconstruing what they read an apologist say. And there, there are dead giveaways that they just do not know what they're talking about. For example, and as you write, uh, they assumed the Pharisees were a priesthood, but the Pharisees were just another order. They had secular jobs. I mean, they were mm -hmm. ne never really a threat to Jesus in the fiction. Yeah, uh, my mother-in-law, who is a really devout Roman Catholic, she, a few years ago, became a Carmelite, quote, nun, unquote. She's not ordained anyway. She doesn't live in a, co a commune, a convent. The Carmelites are uh, lay sisters who engage in charitable things and so on, but she's not clergy, and that's kind of what the Pharisees were. They were just a pious fellowship that said, you know, we, we really mean business here, Let's go above and beyond the call of duty and try to live every day by the purity regulations that the priests have to observe while on duty. So they knew they didn't have to do that. Nobody had to do that. They didn't expect anybody else to. I mean, the whole nature of their enterprise indicates that. And uh, it's not like they were some sort of clergy that could tell you what to do and uh, who... Uh, who uh, despised people who didn't. Uh, it's just uh, more uh, Oberammergau horned Jews uh, nonsense. And lastly, it's another issue that fundamentalists have struggled with, and uh, let us know how O'Reilly deals and Dugard deals with it, is the idea where John has a different Last Supper and crucifixion than the synoptics. How do they deal with this, and how did this happen? Well, I think uh, originally the um, in in Mark followed by Matthew, it there's no hint that it's a pass. In, yeah, in the the story, the little incident itself of the the Last Supper and what is said, there's no hint that it's a Passover. Uh, the the way it is plugged into the um, the rest of the the bits and pieces, the fragments that have been strung together to form the passion narrative, it it, it you're led to believe this had to be a Passover. Where do you want us to prepare the Passover for you? And uh, once they get there, well, we have this scene, but it doesn't look like it really belongs there. If it was Passover, there's no real hint of it. Uh, they're dealing with other things. Luke realizes that the link is not so secure, so he actually has Jesus at the table say, how I've longed to eat this Passover with you. So he knew it was uh, kind of dubious otherwise. And, and John has um, Jesus crucified uh, as the Passover lambs were slain, so that uh, Jesus' death is that of a Passover sacrifice. Paul already makes that connection, but he doesn't say when anything happened. He just says, Jesus is our Passover. Well, uh, okay, John has manipulated it theologically and in a, in a brilliant way. It's uh, well done. Uh, but uh, th the fact that uh, he's made that chronological change is the root of the problem. Well, literalists don't like this, so they go with a, a suggestion made by Annie Jobert back in, I think, the early 60s in a book called The Date of the Last Supper, where she points out that there were calendar disputes between different groups, like the Qumran uh, people thought that the Pharisees and the temple authorities were following the wrong calendar, and therefore their holy days were on the wrong days, and therefore... Uh, not holy days. I mean, they were real sticklers. The whole Enoch thing implies huge calendar debates back then. And uh, so Jobert suggested, hey, what if Jesus, who was your, hardly your typical Jew, uh, he 
followed the Qumran calendar. And so he did have the Passover supper on a different date. Uh, then, so that, that would explain it, how uh, they're eating Passover, even though it's going to happen for most Jews the next day or the next night. Well, that's pretty clever. And um, O'Reilly and Dugards don't know about her. They just uh, attribute this solution to uh, Pope Ratzinger, uh, who uh, must have quoted it. I've, I think I've read his book, I don't remember, but he must have gotten it from uh, Jobert, because uh, her views are well known among scholars. But O'Reilly and Degard don't know that, and so they misattribute the thing. But they also don't notice, as Jobert didn't notice, that uh, in John, it clearly assumes that uh, the Last Supper is not a Passover supper, but that that is for the next day. Because uh, when Judas, uh, when Jesus says to Judas, uh, go do what you have to do, and he leaves, the others figure he sent them out to buy something they needed for the Passover supper. Well, you're not making prep. What is it? You mean next year? I mean, that's not something you're going to say if you're having the Passover right then. I know you could say it's like a parents that find they don't have any batteries on Christmas morning, so they got to find a store that's open to get some. But, uh, oops, we forgot the lamb. Uh, Judas, you think you can go get one? This is Passover. You're not going to find Jewish merchants. Uh, I mean, it, it can't mean that. It has to mean that Passover is tomorrow. And so that alone, I think, shoots the whole thing. It just does not work. All right, Bob, I think that's all the time we have today. I'd like to thank you very much for coming on AM Byte again and discussing Archons here and there, oh my, and uh, your new book, uh, Killing History, which I enjoy thoroughly. Oh, I'm so glad. I appreciate that. And it's a great honor to be on the show. Always great to have you on. And uh, next time you're in Chicago, let's have some more pie. Oh, yeah, that's great. I love, uh, what's it, Giordano's. Yeah. There you go, yeah. Giordano's. Talk our, about a sacramental feast. <laughs> our last, hopefully that won't be our last supper. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> All right, you, Bob. You, thank you very much. And you uh, look forward to your next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. I'll cut your throat if you squeeze mine I'll shake your hand 